From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And the introduction means it's time for me to welcome you back. Welcome back to the Cannabis Podcast. If this is a return visit for you, maybe this is your very first visit. Well, if it is, let me give you an especially warm welcome. What's ahead? Well, how about 30 or 40 minutes of information filled with cannabis? <laughs> yes, we're going to stick it into your brain. All this information about cannabis you may know, you may know from before, or perhaps some of it's going to be new to you as well. Before we get too much further, let me remind you, this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended purely for entertainment and perhaps for educational purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. In episode 150, we are going to look at the cannabis industry wondering, hey, when's our relief coming? There is some company restructuring happening on Salt Spring Island. We have a story that makes you wonder if the mainstream media really understands cannabis, especially edibles. Ontario is getting a bit of a revenue boost from cannabis. Germany has joined Canada as a place with legalized recreational cannabis. And I'm going to stop on Cultivar Corner and a trip back to the Kootenays for some Woody Nelson's Purple God. Mm -mm -mm. All of that and more on episode 150 of the Cannabis Podcast. And as usual, I want to thank you for being a listener. Thank you so much for being here. I truly appreciate it. And I also, of course, want to thank my supporters, Jordana, Keith, and Jordan at buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast. If you feel so inclined and you like what you hear, you can go there too and buy me a doobie, or you can become a subscriber as well. Also, I want to thank my patrons at Patreon. Thanks to Tony, Roger, Rob, Gage, and Lloyd. I truly appreciate your support. And also, I want to thank Lloyd for pointing out the Jones Soda cannabis-infused drinks. They have not yet shown up in BC, but Lloyd had a taste of them. <laughs> he has not been terribly happy with the taste of cannabis drinks to date, but he found these ones quite delicious and perhaps a little too powerful. <laughs> I'm going to keep my eye for their appearance in BC. Thanks for pointing that out to me, Lloyd. Also, I want a special shout out to my other Patreon, Tony. Tony has finally followed my advice. He picked up his first dry herb vaporizer. He's excited about that, and I think we can expect to share his review on some future episode. So thanks very much for being a listener, and thanks so much for your support. Also, you know what? I want to thank Tarek Shabib. Tarek was my boss for almost four years at Spirit Relief Kelowna. Tarek treated me so well while I was there. Well, he also treated me, along with my friend Jericho and some close family members, to a retirement dinner. Yes. <laughs> we dined at the New Bernie's in downtown Kelowna. Delicious meal at a rather tasty chocolate martini. And some great conversation about the last four years. And it was a hoot the last four years. A fabulous time was had by all. So thanks to Don, my brother, Jeanette, my sister-in-law, my wife, Jan, my son, Ian, Jericho, Tarek. There were some real fond memories. Thanks so much to everyone. And another story from Stratcan.com today, this on the cannabis industry, wondering when their relief is coming too. In an announcement on March 9th, the Canadian government said it plans to provide thousands of dollars in alcohol excise duty relief to Canadian businesses, particularly local craft breweries. Canada's cannabis industry has been asking for similar relief for years, with some noting their industry is larger and more heavily taxed and regulated than even beer makers. In order to help alcohol businesses, the federal government is proposing to cap the inflation adjustment at 2% for beer, spirit, and wine excise duties for an additional two years, and to cut the excise duty rate on the first 15,000 hectoliters of beer brewed in Canada by half for two years. The government says this will provide the typical craft brewery up to $86,000 in additional tax relief in 2024-25. In a press release, with comments from Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance Christian Freeland and Minister of Small Business Richie Valdez, the government acknowledges the number of jobs created by the brewing industry in Canada and the contribution this makes to the broader economy. This announcement is great news for breweries, distilleries and wineries from all across Canada who contribute so much to our national economy, says Valdez. Not only are they producing incredible products, they are also small businesses who are creating jobs and opportunities in their local communities. Today's relief on alcohol to excise taxes will allow craft breweries to spend less on duties and more on what matters most, growing and innovating their small businesses. Jonathan Wilson, CEO of Crystal Cure, a small-scale cannabis producer in New Brunswick, said he found the news difficult to swallow given how much his industry is currently struggling. For the ministers to announce this excise tax relief for alcohol today, with the core message being to support small business in peril, is one of two things, cold-hearted or oblivious. 
and I can't tell which one. Small cannabis producers that have been suffering under the current industry ecosystem, they're the ones without the cash flow to absorb the exorbitant taxes and fees, and they can't sell at a loss in perpetuity. These producers were supposed to be the cornerstones of the industry, and it seems everyone is fine with them being allowed to crumble. Deepak Anand, an industry analyst and consultant, shared similar sentiments with Strachan. The federal government needs to urgently make some similar provisions available for the cannabis industry, which has been struggling much harder than the alcohol industry. Much like alcohol... There are dozens of craft cannabis cultivators who can benefit greatly from similar relief. For a comparison, according to StatsCan in 2022, breweries employed nearly 23,000 Canadians. A Deloitte report from 2021 said the cannabis industry employed more than 43,000 direct and another 180,000 indirect jobs in its first three years. In 2018, the Conference Board of Canada reported that the beer industry supported 149,000 Canadian jobs, paid $5.3 billion in wages, and contributed $13.6 billion to Canada's GDP in 2016. A Deloitte report from 2021 said the Canadian cannabis industry contributed $45.5 billion to Canada's GDP in its first three years, or an average of about $15 billion a year. Canada's small craft breweries are among the finest in the world and are an important contributor to our growing economy by creating jobs in communities across the country. Today's announcement is good news for Canadians and for the craft breweries they visit, which now will benefit from thousands of dollars in new tax relief every year, said Freeland in a press release. Well, <laughs> as the story points out, <laughs> where is this similar relief for the cannabis industry? <laughs> Apparently it's okay to drink up, but you better not be smoking. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And for our next story, we're going to StratCan.com, and this was written by staff. BC Outdoor Cannabis Grower's Good Buds Company filed a notice of intention to make a proposal pursuant to the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act. In a memo from March 6th, a representative for the Salt Spring Island-based company emphasized that it has not filed for bankruptcy, nor is it in receivership. It's not uncommon for companies to file such notices as a way to restructure their debt rather than going into bankruptcy proceedings. According to the formal notice, the company remains under the control of its management team. The NOI creates a stay of proceedings and allows the company a period of up to 30 days to prepare and file a proposal to its creditors unless the period is extended by the court upon application by the company, it continues. The company also reportedly continues to operate and all amounts owed as of the date of the NOI will be dealt with as part of the proposal which is to be filed at a future date. The company lists more than $18 million in amounts due claimed by creditors, with the most significant amount being $10.6 million to GoodBuds Company International. The company also lists Farm Credit Canada, claiming to be owed nearly $3.2 million, nearly $3.2 million to the Receiver General of Canada for excise, $26,000 to Health Canada, and about $11,000 to the Ministry of Finance. These amounts are not necessarily in arrears, but can simply represent ongoing expenses. And let's hope that they come through that restructuring in a good state on the other side. Good Buds grows on Salt Spring Island, grows some really fine weed. Like many cannabis companies having a little bit of trouble right now, and hopefully they come through on the other side in a positive manner. Another story from StratCan.com. And who was the author of this one? Well, what a surprise. David Brown, the author of this one. You may have heard a recent story that popped up on the news of some kids in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where they had some really high dose edibles. And the media reporting on that was not very clear in the fact that those came from not the legal market. <laughs> a whole bunch of issues with that. That's what this story is all about. Following an incident in Halifax where several students under the age of 12 were taken to hospital after eating cannabis edibles, a new media report confirms the edibles were not legal. While the initial media reports did not note if the products were legal or illegal, the article referred to them as labeled. A follow-up article from the Canadian Press shows a picture of what is clearly an edible from the illicit market. But the article itself predictably fails to clearly note the distinction between legal and illegal edibles, and how they are packaged and sold, or the THC content of those products. This is an ongoing issue, with researchers, academics, and the media still seemingly unaware of how widespread these illicit, unregulated edibles are packaged to mimic traditional candy and snack foods like Nerds, Doritos, Oreos, Skittles, and many more. In this most recent incident in Halifax, at least five kids consumed the product after one child brought them to school. Four of those kids went to the hospital for their symptoms. One mother, a healthcare worker, said in an interview that her son threw up multiple times and had to be rushed to the emergency department. Another mother, who spoke to the Canadian press on the condition of anonymity, 
said her child was taken to intensive care for treatment before stabilizing. Despite the image shown in the article showing a package of Nerd Bites advertising at least 1,000 mg of THC with each bite containing 200 mg THC, the article itself does very little to clearly communicate that these are not products from Canada's legal cannabis industry. A modicum of research would clearly show the author of the article that legal cannabis edible products cannot be packaged in such a way, do not resemble regular candies like Nerds, and can only come with THC of 10 mg per package, not 1,000. Only halfway down the article does the author cite a comment from the NSLC that notes this discrepancy. But even then, the article doesn't make the distinction clear or even attempt to do so. A spokeswoman for the Nova Scotia Liquor Corp., the only licensed distributor of cannabis products in the province, says it only buys from licensed producers who are regulated by Health Canada and the Federal Cannabis Act. The law generally prohibits the promotion of cannabis, and packaging is to adhere to strict requirements, including labeling, child-resistant containers, and plain packaging that must not appeal to youth. This type of lazy conflation of the significant difference between legal and illegal edible products is not new. Researchers and media in the past few years have breathlessly reported on hospitalizations of young people after they consumed cannabis edibles, often without an acknowledgement of how prevalent these types of highly appealing and very high THC products are in Canada, or the fact that they only became common in Canada around the same time legal edible products began hitting shelves. Such distinctions are obvious for those who actually understand the law in Canada. Legal cannabis edibles cannot mimic trademark snack product brands, cannot contain more than 10 mg THC per package, and are sold only through authorized sources. As long as the media, academics, and other researchers continue to misunderstand such an obvious distinction, people will continue to be encouraged to blame the legal market for what is evidently an issue with the illegal, unregulated market. This also continues to impact the legal market as concerns with issues like young people presenting at hospitals after consuming edibles are used to maintain the current 10 mg THC limit for legal edibles, while ignoring that these hospitalizations are more than likely due to much higher potency products that are far more appealing and accessible to young people. Another excellent article from David Brown at stratcan.com something that I've been observing for a while, people just don't seem to get it that there is a clear distinction between the legal Canadian cannabis market and the illicit market, especially in terms of THC dosages. Will we ever get this right? THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner. Go to the corner. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it really sucks having a cold. <laughs> I've had this one for a couple of weeks now. Uh, I thought it was was dealt with, <laughs> but I'm realizing that it isn't. So it may have an impact on my cultivar corner today. I am really looking forward to this. This is the latest from Woody Nelson, out of Nelson. And it is their Purple God, which is a cross of God Bud and Purple Skunk. Now, once again, I had Kilo Cannabis deliver this to me for Cultivar Corner. Thanks very much, Eric. Appreciate it. And uh, said he'd already tried this, enjoyed it. Really nostalgic is what he said. Took him back a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> That's just because I'm just, it's morning and I haven't spoken yet. <laughs> so let's crack the, let's crack the bag and let's see what this smells like. In my cold infused ability to smell. Oh, <laughs> well, apparently the cold isn't affecting it too much, but my goodness. Oh, is that ever delightful? Okay, let me get my scale out. Let's make sure we are sitting on that proper range of roughly three and a half grams. Can go up a little bit if it wants. I really don't like it when I go down. Pull out my first bud. Let's take a peek. Oh my, look at that. Dark green. Dark red pistols. Mmm, and trichome covered. Now let's see what we got in terms of weight. I got one, two. I only got four buds. No, that's not true. <laughs> no, that is true. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with four buds when it adds up to 3.5. And I am 3.5 on the money with my Woody Nelson. Purple God. So four substantive buds. Let me pull out my juicer, jeweler's loop. And let's take a peek. Oh, my, my, my. 
really dark green. This is one of the darkest greens that I've seen in a while. Let's take one of those buds and let's split it up so I can now roll my joint and get something ready for the Air Max. And now we want to see how sticky it is. Pretty sticky. Pretty sticky. That bud breaks up really nicely. Mm, and the aromas come flying out when you break that bud up. So what am I sitting at? My THC is sitting at 25.6. My total terps at 2.8. Perhaps would have thought there'd be a little bit more terps in that, but there's definitely a lot of aroma. And what are the aromas? And this was one thing, I, I love the fact that we're always learning something. <laughs> Regardless of what we're doing, we're always learning something. So let me give you the line on Woody Nelson's edition of Purple God. The genetic was bred in the Kootenai region and grown at an indoor vertical farm using organic living soil. This high THC cultivar is rich in terpenes, including D-limonene, beta-caryophylline, and beta-myrcene, with subtle notes of zest and umami. The plant's frosty pods are hand-trimmed, cured for a minimum of three weeks, and never irradiated. So you heard me say in the aromas, zesty and umami. When was the first time that you became aware of the word umami or me? <laughs> it was about 30 seconds ago when I came across this into the aroma section. There's a picture of, of what looked like some mushrooms and perhaps some herbs. So I had to look it up. Maybe you are familiar with this. I'm, I'm perhaps ignorant on this fact. Umami. It is a category of taste in food besides sweet, sour, salt, and bitter. It corresponds to the flavor of glutamate especially monosodium glutamate. Now, I wasn't expecting there to be any monosodium glutamate in my weed, <laughs> but that is the flavor aroma they're talking about. So let's give you the rest. This high THC cultivar is rich in terpenes, including D-limonene, beta caryophylline beta myrcene with notes of berries and kush. The plant's frosty buds are hand-trimmed, cured for a minimum of three weeks, and never irradiated. And they have been immaculately cured. These are just some beautiful buds. I can tell the who was trimming that, put that up aside. I said, that's a beauty bud. <laughs> Again, my, my aroma is perhaps not as noticeable today simply because I do have still a lingering cold that's hanging on. Worst part of that cold was just worked in, as they often do for me, worked into a nice little bronchial chest cough. I'm hoping that goes away soon so I don't have to go see a doctor about it i got enough things happening in my life. I don't need to see a doctor about something else right now. <laughs> so as I said, as I break up the Woody Nelson Purple God, uh, really, really sticky. A lot more aromas come bursting forth as you break those buds up. The other thing I find interesting about our cannabis world these days, and we've been talking about it ever since legalization happened some five years ago, and that is to try to get away from this bucket, <laughs> indica, sativa, and hybrid. And it's tough. It's going to be a lot of years before we get there. <laughs> uh, by way of explanation, so this is Purple God, BC, a uh, God Bud, and Purple Skunk, definitely hitting on the indica side of things. So I got my joint rolled. Let me get my Air Max ready to rock and roll with some weed in it. And that's ready to rock and roll. Let's stick her in there. And first taste today, we're going to take it off of the Air Max. So let's get the full flavor profile. This is Purple God, which is a cross of God Bud and Purple Skunk from our friends at Woody Nelson over in the Kootenays. And here it is in the Air Max. Wow. Now, I'm, I'm not comparing it to the joint, obviously, because I haven't lit the joint yet. But, Wow. <laughs> Just an abundance of aromas once you put it in that vaporizer. And you've heard me talk about vaporizers for a long time. I'll tell you something that's coming up. I know Tony. Tony is one of my subscribers at Patreon. Tony just picked himself up a dry herb vaporizer. He's finally heard the message. <laughs> and Tony is preparing a review of some stuff that he's looking at. He's going to send that to me. And we'll share that with you sometime in the future. That's a cool idea. I like that, Tony. Thanks for the idea. Okay, let's get the joint going. Oh, that is just so smooth through the vaporizer. So smooth. And after those three hits, oh, that's feeling pretty good too. THC 25.8, terpenes total terps at 
that <laughs> one of the things that I have come across that I find most amusing as I do these cultivar corners, and then I throw them into transcription services, and almost every time it throws comes back with a transcript, and I say the word terpenes, it comes out either as turbines <laughs> or chirpings. <laughs> it has not yet transcribed the word terpene correctly. <laughs> Maybe because it's just too new. Okay, now through the joint, there's definitely a little earthiness there. And that, I would think, would be coming from the myrcene. And in, in terms of the umami, <laughs> I'm afraid because it's something that I just discovered the name of, I don't even know what it tastes like. Umami translates to pleasant, savory taste and has been described as brothy or meaty. <laughs> Well, I can't say I'm picking up any brothy or meaty aromas or tastes. It's a pleasant taste. Don't get me wrong. Really? Oh, my, my, my. And here come the happy eyes. Here comes the euphoria. <laughs> I've been waiting for this today. I hung on for a bit, waiting for my delivery to uh, arrive. And once it did, I jumped right into here. And the fact that I still got a cold... And there's still some cough going on in my chest. I've been pretty pleased that I've been able to slide through this and not get a lot of coughing noises. Oh, this is really nice. Let's get the low down on Purple God, Woody Nelson. It's only available in three and a half grams. That is what I picked up. A craft flower, three and a half grams of frosty hand trimmed buds. Now, you may not be aware of this, but let's tell you what Woody Nelson does. They grow in organic living soil, they do vertical farming, and they do biomimics. Biomimetics. Biomimetics. Yes, our biomimetic approach takes guidance from the genius of nature. Plants have more excellent outcomes when we can mimic their natural habitat and optimal growing conditions. We achieve this through our true living organic soil, granola, pure glacial water, customized lighting spectrum, and superior controlled environment infrastructure that can replicate any growing environment on Earth. Well, <laughs> they've done a pretty good job of replicating this growing environment on Earth. Oh, and again, through the vaporizer, there's just so much more of the flavor. Like the flavor just comes bursting through. Liked everything that we have tasted from Woody Nelson so far, and I don't think this is an exception to the rule. God Bod Purple Skunk THC 25.6, total terps 2.8. I'm getting blasted. <laughs> Again, that indica sativa splitted mix that we still have to figure out. <laughs> this may not be a good time for me to be smoking indica. It could be a deep, dark nap this afternoon. But that's the way it works, right? It's my job, and I'm, and I'm proud to do it for you. <laughs> Woody Nelson, Purple God, God Bud, and Purple Skunk. 25.6 TAC, 2.8% terps, and about 85% high. <laughs> I don't know if you can put that into percentages or not, but I'm feeling really good right now. Not moving into a whole lot of body stone yet, but I assume that's going to happen after a period of time. Really enjoying the high so far. Once more, some good product out of the Kootenays. Woody Nelson, ah, <laughs> you done make me proud of my hometown. And as I am often wont to do, <laughs> after the fact, and had a little time for the endocannabinoid system, my CB1 primarily receptors to absorb all of that in my brain and my spinal cord. <sighs> nice little body relaxation happening there. I'm quite enjoying that. Always a nice treat with some of the indicas that are out there. And there was something else that I wanted to point out that I had forgotten to. I commented in a couple of episodes ago about how we should always be checking our dates. That there's a lot of old weed that's still sliding through those retail doors, and we want the freshest stuff we can get into our hands. So when I put in this order, I did actually say, you know what, I don't want anything old. If it's in the 23, uh, let's cancel the order. Very pleased, my Woody Nelson Purple God showed up, and the package date, the harvest date, January 14th, 2024, and the package date, February 16th, 2024. That's nice and fresh. Really pleased to see that. I'm glad to see that there's some changes happening in that, that we're getting fresher weed into our hands. Fresher. 
sharing stories about good weed while trying good weed. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And another story by Matt Lamers at mjbizdaily.com. Ontario's provincial government is budgeting for a record windfall of more than $600 million Canadian dollars in the next fiscal year from cannabis wholesale profits and its portion of the federal excise tax. The windfall comes after a federal report to Canadian Finance Minister Chrystia Freeland revealed that after five years of legalization, there are no licensed producers of legal cannabis products that are consistently profitable. According to the provincial budget released Tuesday for the fiscal year April 2024 to March 2025, the government said it expects to receive $379 million from its portion of the federal cannabis duty, a 22% increase over the 2023-24 fiscal year. That's despite the fact that cannabis producers in Ontario had federal excise debts totaling roughly $100 million as of December 2023. Ontario's portion of the federal excise duty is paid via the Coordinated Cannabis Taxation Agreement, which the province signed with the federal government before legalization. The deal effectively grants 75% of the excise duty collected by the federal government from Ontario wholesale cannabis sales to the provincial government. The federal government keeps the rest. Ontario also dips into cannabis industry coffers via the province-owned Ontario Cannabis Store, which has a monopoly over adult-use wholesale sales in the province. The OCS also makes a small amount of money from its online sales channel. The province is forecasting that the OCS will earn a profit of $225 million for the 24-25 fiscal year. The OCS has come under fire for reporting profits beyond what some industry sources consider to be reasonable, considering the provincial Crown Corporation has been the most profitable enterprise in the cannabis industry. For example, Ontario's expected $604 million cannabis windfall would exceed what the province is expecting to collect from taxes applied to beer, wine, and spirits combined. Separately, Ontario's budget committed $31 million over the next three years to crack down on illegal cannabis businesses, especially those which operate online. The government is committed to combating the illegal cannabis market, to ensure the integrity of the regulated private retail model, and address the significant health risks associated with illegal cannabis products that do not meet government safety standards, according to the provincial budget. The new cash will go to what Ontario's so-called Provincial Joint Forces Cannabis Enforcement Team which is an initiative led by the Ontario Provincial Police targeting illegal marijuana storefronts. The province said the money would enable the police to respond to the challenge of illegal online operators and crack down on the online sale and distribution of illegal cannabis. As a CEO of a cannabis retailer with 58 legal stores and more than 600 employees in Ontario, I welcome the Ford government's decision to take aggressive action against illegal online cannabis dispensaries who blatantly target kids and sell unsafe products. High Tide CEO Raj Grover said in a statement, Today's move makes it clear that Ontario is committed to safety and supporting its legal cannabis industry. So more windfalls coming for more of the provincial retailers (laughs) who seem to be the only ones really making money in this legal cannabis world. (laughs) Let's see what those changes mean in the future. And for our next story, we're going to the bbc.com. The German Parliament has backed a new law to allow the recreational use of cannabis. Under the law, over 18s in Germany will be allowed to possess substantial amounts of cannabis, but strict rules will make it difficult to buy the drug. Smoking cannabis in many public spaces will become legal from April 1st. Possession of up to 25 grams, equivalent to dozens of strong joints, is to be allowed in public spaces. In private homes, the legal limit will be 50 grams. Already police in some parts of Germany, such as Berlin, often turned a blind eye to smoking in public, although possession of the drug for recreational use is illegal and can be prosecuted. Use of the drug among young people has been soaring for years despite the existing law, says Health Minister Karl Lutterbach, who is instigating the reforms. He wants to undermine the black market, protect smokers from contaminated cannabis, and cut revenue streams for organized crime gangs. But legal cannabis cafes will not suddenly spring up all over the country. A ferocious debate about decriminalizing cannabis has been raging for years in Germany, with doctors' groups expressing concerns for young people and conservatives saying that liberalization will fuel drug use. After a stormy session on Friday in the Bundestag, Germany's parliament, the vote was eventually passed by 407 votes to 226. Simone Borchardt of the opposition conservative CDU told MPs that the government had gone ahead with its completely unnecessary, confused law regardless of warnings from doctors, police, and psychotherapists. But Mr. Lauterbach said the current situation was no longer tenable. The number of consumers aged between 18 and 25 has doubled in the last 10 years. 
After the vote, he said the law would dry out the black market and fix a failed drug policy. As so often in Germany, the law approved by MPs is complicated. Smoking cannabis in some areas, such as near schools and sports grounds, will still be illegal. Crucially, the market will be strictly regulated, so buying the drug will not be easy. Original plans to allow licensed shops and pharmacies to sell cannabis have been scrapped over EU concerns that this could lead to a surge in drug exports. Instead, non-commercial members clubs, dubbed cannabis social clubs, will grow and distribute a limited amount of the drug. Each club will have an upper limit of 500 members, consuming cannabis on-site will not be allowed, and membership will only be available to German residents. Growing your own cannabis will also be permitted with up to three marijuana plants allowed per household. This means that Germany could be in the paradoxical position of allowing possession of rather large amounts of the drug while at the same time making it difficult to purchase. Regular smokers would benefit, but occasional users would struggle to buy it legally, and tourists would be excluded. Critics say this will simply fuel the black market. Over the next few years, the government wants to assess the impact of the new law and eventually introduce the licensed sale of cannabis. But given how tortuous the debate has been so far, nothing is certain. Meanwhile, opposition conservatives say that if they get into government next year, they'll scrap the law entirely. Germany is unlikely to become Europe's new Amsterdam anytime soon. Well, I think it's positive that there is another country that has legalized recreational cannabis. We're still trying to figure out the best way to do this. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. The Cannabis Council of Canada, C3, has appointed a new president. A former executive at Canopy Growth with extensive experience working with the public sector at the federal level. Paul McCarthy was announced as the new president of the National Canadian Cannabis Industry Association on April 2nd, following the former CEO and President George Smitherman stepping down in January. There's great potential for the cannabis sector to flourish in Canada, said McCarthy. It can contribute to the country's productivity and provide good-paying, sustainable jobs. That, however, can only be achieved through a reformed regulatory regime and the eradication of the illicit market, said Paul McCarthy, president of C3. I look forward to working collaboratively with government and other stakeholders to make this industry the success story it can be. Rick Savone, chair of the Cannabis Council of Canada and the senior VP at Aurora Cannabis, expressed the board's enthusiasm about McCarthy's appointment. We are delighted to welcome Paul McCarthy as the new president of the Cannabis Council of Canada. His wealth of experience and proven track record in policy development and stakeholder engagement make him instrumental in driving C3's annual strategic plan. We're confident that under his leadership, C3 will continue to be a leading voice in advocating for a thriving and responsible cannabis industry. McCarthy has received recognition for public service in managing the British Columbia component of the Infrastructure Stimulus Program that saw a total investment of $1.2 billion to complete 450 projects over a two-year period. In addition, during his time with Veteran Affairs, he led the redesign and enhancement of financial benefits for Canadian Armed Forces veterans, culminating in the Pension for Life, which provided greater financial security for many veteran families. McCarthy spent the last three years at Canopy, most recently as head of corporate policy, as well as previous roles as head of international implementation and as a strategic advisor to then-president and CEO Bruce Linton. He has held several high-level roles with various federal ministries. C3 has served as the main national industry association for Canada's cannabis industry since it was medical only, but has struggled to maintain membership in recent years as the industry struggles to survive in a highly regulated and taxed environment. So nice to see new changes at the top of the C3 organization, the Canadian National Reference for Cannabis. I hope you do a good job in the role, Paul, and we wish you the best of luck. It doesn't matter how high the THC is. The entourage effect is always waiting for you here. This is the Cannabis Podcast. Well, we're starting to go back through the memory banks. (laughs) Sometimes easily retrievable, sometimes not. (laughs) I do have to apologize. I realized as I was checking the details for the last episode, where I again told, and I realized now it wasn't again. (laughs) I had already told my parents the story of my parents having some green cannabis (laughs) and my brother Bill involved. I'm sorry, I'll try not to do that again. I looked back and found the reference today. What's concerning me today, and what I'm thinking about today, is we are getting ready to have a celebration of life from my brother Bill. That's coming up in June of this year, and we're starting to think about some things, gather some pictures, gather some events, gather some stories, gather some thoughts. 
<laughs> and there is no doubt that my brother Bill loved smoking weed. Once he discovered weed, which was fairly early on in his life, <laughs> it was not his only indulgence. He liked to drink it a lot, too. And drinking and cannabis kind of went hand in hand. <laughs> he used to go for these walks up the Idaho Peak in the New Denver area, up the top of the mountain. <laughs> Always amazed me that, that he was continuing to make these climbs throughout most of his life. He and his buddies would smoke a joint or have one of his special ginger cookies. And he used to make what he thought were absolutely delicious ginger cookies. <laughs> it surprised the heck out of him that they did nothing for me. He dropped off a bunch of cookies one time when he was visiting us. And I'm, I'm sure I must have eaten three or four of those, hoping I was going to get a buzz. But as, as you know, if you've listened to this podcast at all, I do not get a lot of buzz off of edibles still trying to figure out why my endocannabinoid system doesn't react to those, but they sure work for my brother, Bill. <laughs> he would go walking up that Idaho peak with his dog, Harley, and then his dog, Rosie, and various friends tagging along with him, blasted on his cannabis ginger cookies, the weed that he grew every year in the Kootenays, and harvested and processed, and then made a big, big batch of cookies, and he shared them with a lot of different people. I wish they worked on me, but unfortunately they didn't. <laughs> but we shared a lot of joints together over the course of time, did my brother Bill and I, uh, from the time that I first started smoking, probably around 17 years old, until uh, probably just a couple of months, a few months before he passed away. The last time I saw him, we did share another joint. I remember coming to visit him one time when he was in Silverton, which was just down the road from New Denver, which is a town where I was actually born. And we proceeded to spend the day, um, started at the golf course, then worked our way through various areas in his truck. And I think most of that day, there was a joint going, <laughs> going back and forth. Uh, we shared a lot of joints over the course of time. <laughs> so I'm starting to think about some things we can chat about, some other stories that I can relate, and some pictures that we're trying to find as we get ready for that celebration of life coming up in June. Always lots of good memories from my brother, Bill, and uh, they're always fun to share as well. And once more, I want to thank you so much for being a listener. I truly appreciate the fact that you are here listening to the Cannabis Podcast. It means a lot to me. And remember, if you ever want to comment on anything you hear on the Cannabis Podcast, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. And remember, of course, if you want more ways to support, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast. If you like what you hear and you feel so inclined, you can buy me a doobie there. Or you can become a patron of the podcast on Patreon. And the links to all of those are at the top right on the Cannabis Podcast show page. And that wraps it up for episode 150 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Season one of Dope History is now available at dopehistory.com. Dope History weaves you through the lives of those who have been touched by cannabis or have had an influence on the events that shaped our laws or relationships with this plant. You'll hear tales from Frenchie Cannoli, Keith Strop, Eddie Lepp, Tom Alexander, Ed Rosenthal, Wolf Seagull, Jorge Cervantes, and Tommy Chong. Available now at dopehistory.com.